My name is Larry Kessler. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine located in Philadelphia. Welcome to our podcast series. In this series, authors discuss their books with experts from a variety of professions and backgrounds. These discussions spotlight the relevance of historical scholarship to current issues in science, technology, and medicine. Today, we'll discuss race, anthropology, and the collection and display of human remains with Samuel Redman. Sam is Associate Professor of History at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the author of Bone Rooms, From Scientific Racism to Human Prehistory in Museums. Bone Rooms explores the history of human remains collecting. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, individuals and institutions, including the Smithsonian, the Army Medical Museum, and the Mütter Museum, sought to obtain skeletons, fossils, and mummies from around the world for scientific research and public display. Although collectors hoped these specimens would provide evidence to support contemporary theories of racial classification, ultimately the study of human remains led to the decline of race theory, while the bone rooms themselves came to be used by anthropologists studying human origins and evolution. The collection and display of bodily remains became central to debates about ethics, repatriation, and scientific authority that continue today. In this episode, two experts joined Sam to discuss his book. Lauren Malloy, Program Director at the Association for the Preservation of Historical Congressional Cemetery, and Beth Lander, College Librarian at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. First, we want to welcome Sam to introduce Bone Rooms. Hello, my name is Sam Redman, and I'm a historian. I teach modern U.S. history and public history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm the author of Bone Rooms, From Scientific Racism to Human Prehistory in Museums. I was so fortunate to get some really amazing questions in response to this this book. And one of them was uh, about why I even chose to write the book Bone Rooms. A reasonable answer, I think, to that really great question would be that I wanted to stimulate a conversation about a story or a series of stories that I think was sort of known by some people who worked in museums or had a degree in anthropology or or had studied archaeology or or something like that. But a lot of people, including a lot of really smart people that I know who spend a lot of time in museums, have told me how floored they were to learn about not only the fact that uh, human remains were collected for museums in the United States, but the massive scale in which uh, so many remains were collected. I want to thank everyone that is involved in making this podcast, those that ask questions, and I want to thank everyone who took the time to read the book Bone Rooms and thought more about the history of collecting and exhibiting human remains. I'm really grateful to have taken a part in trying to advance this story, and I hope people continue thinking about it and uh, the challenging legacies that are left behind. Our first questions come from Lauren Malloy, Program Director at the Association for the Preservation of Historical Congressional Cemetery. At Historic Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., we occasionally work with anthropologists to disinter human remains from vaults before these vaults undergo any preservation efforts. Uh, the skeletons are always reinterred. Uh, after the Smithsonian conducts analyses on these remains. So I found your comment in the prologue about human remains losing their spiritual context once they are taken from a cemetery or burial ground extremely interesting. Um, In our case, obviously, it's much different than what happens uh, throughout your book, but once they are taken from our cemetery, they are used for science, but the individual uh, backgrounds are also researched. They are, in a sense, gifted more humanity through these scientific studies, in my opinion. But for indigenous human remains, when there's limited information as to where they came from exactly, uh, is it possible to give the same gift of humanity, in your opinion? This is a really interesting question, and in light of the take of your work in in, uh, cemeteries, in thinking about how best to disinter remains when that becomes necessary, how to do so respectfully, And 
Indeed, I, I come at this book from a position of having a great deal of respect for those who work in those situations. And I also think historically, a lot of that work oftentimes disregarded the points of view of indigenous people, especially, or other people just in general. Uh, it's sort of religious or, or spiritual position on those matters of the treatment of ancestors was often seen as secondary to the desire to have these scientific resources. And indeed, when they were removed from burial grounds or in connection to uh, it, cemeteries and brought to places like museums, where they're given a catalog number and stored on a shelf, I think it's easy to see them as being dehumanized in a certain sort of way, taken from a spiritual context in which their ancestors anticipated and hoped that they might uh, remain to a, a different sort of context. And I would argue we know that, for example, Native people wanted burials to remain in particular contexts because the scientists themselves would talk about being chased or attacked or, or uh, under, under sort of physical assault from when they would try to remove human remains from particular grave sites in the American West. So by removing them against the wishes of Native people at the turn of the century and, and putting them into this different context where they were given a catalog number, it's easy to read potentially uh, in one way uh, how these remains were dehumanized from their uh, original sorts of meanings. The problem in some sense is actually how little these remains were studied and to what degree they were entirely forgotten as, as resources. Now, there are some counterexamples to this. Some collections of human remains were studied quite actively, but I think a lot of native people would charge, you know, you, you collected all of these remains and promised these grandiose promises about unlocking the secrets of the human human past. And, and to what extent have you actually done that and been, been successful? To what extent can you tell us something that maybe our oral traditions or, or other sorts of knowledge can't, uh, can't provide access to? In accessing that science, you've done so in potentially a disrespectful way. So the care that we use today, I would argue, to tell this fuller story about an individual does, as you suggest, work to humanize people in, in ways that historically these efforts were not undertaken to the same degree. So I think there is a, a difference there, and you're right to point that out. But this said, some, many, uh, some indigenous people, I would argue, and, and many Americans more generally might share the view that no amount of scientific research will work to humanize ancestors as remains can only be properly treated as human objects or, uh, you know, objects that are representative of past people, not uh, scientific objects. So once we take them from the sort of particular ceremonial treatments intended to send them off to the next life, but any process that upsets that could potentially be uh, dehumanizing in a way. So it's, it's an area where professionals working in this area need to tread carefully and with a great deal of respect and hopefully in constant consultation with the ancestors of the people in question. Uh, along the same lines as my last question, uh, at the cemetery I work at, we constantly deal with public discomfort over hosting events in the cemetery. Um, and the main complaint, being an obvious one, is that having such events, we are being disrespectful to the dead. Uh, yet many wouldn't think twice and would in fact seek out, as you mentioned throughout your book, exhibitions of human remains in museums. In your opinion, what is the proper way to contextualize human remains to bestow the same public reverence in a museum exhibit or medical museum, even though you note that many museums don't really even attempt these exhibitions anymore? Uh, the, the pushback uh, we sometimes hear from visitors to public events uh, held at beautiful historic cemeteries or challenges surrounding the efforts to contextualize human remains sometimes that are uh, described in public spaces or historic sites like the African-American burial ground in uh, New York City, but especially museums where uh, museums hold thousands of often archeological collections of human remains. So how do we best uh, contextualize these as, as multifaceted objects for visitors? 
Well, for one thing, I, I, I have the view that, that I don't think these should be treated or interpreted or understood as objects that are merely like other objects. Uh, I, I do think that there is something different about human remains that needs to be acknowledged and credited that, say, is different from the objects we make, say, for example, a drinking vessel or displays of Model T Fords at the Henry Ford Museum. I, I think that when you display or, or even are considering interpreting human remains, a serious discussion needs to take place in any context about how best and most respectfully to do that. And again, I think the first step is that one needs to work to connect with uh, descendant groups, especially in questions surrounding indigenous communities, and get a sense of how that community feels uh, about approaches to display of all types of materials, ranging from potentially highly sensitive and, and sacred human remains and burial goods to things that you know maybe are, are considered less less sacred uh, and more everyday, like a, a drinking vessels or uh, toys and, and games. These things, I think, can be treated differently and with the proper respect shown to more sensitive objects in consultation with descendant groups about how to approach that. Sometimes that means, you know, explaining to visitors that they're they're entering a space that is different from the other spaces in the museum. The lighting may change. It may be more appropriate to have a, a quiet space than a, a space like other galleries that may have ambient noise or, or audio information being presented. So there are ways in which I think people can contextualize human remains in respectful ways that can create environments that enable learning. But I would also say, and this is something that I would imagine every cemetery that's also a historic site or medical museum uh, encounters, is that there's still a, a segment of the population that will revile at any exhibition of any human remains at any point. On the other hand, in spite of this phenomenon, there are a huge number of people that conversely are very interested and compelled by any sort of display of human remains and uh, will be quite curious about it and, and, and will in fact treat it with the proper amount of reverence and respect in, in the proper uh, context. The main emphasis in your book was not necessarily the human remains themselves, but the way in which they were collected and then treated as museum objects. So what, what were your goals in researching and presenting this information? Was it simply to make academics and the public aware of this complicated history? Or was it with the aim of influencing how these human remains are treated moving forward? Or as I imagine your answer might be, was it a little bit of both? My goals, uh, as you imagined or anticipated in the question, were multi-layered. Yes, I, I did want to shed light on the history of, of these events. And I think that merely looking at that history between the about the Civil War and, and Second World War is it in and of itself significant and, and fascinating and compelling. Again, as the question anticipated, I did want to make an impact on the conversation surrounding human remains in museum contexts, especially moving forward. A review of the book in the journal American Anthropologist from a former museum professional with experience working with uh, human remains collections noted how he wished he could have had the book to share with museum trustees. And that was, to me, one of the most humbling things that's been met, written about the book is that it would be useful in sort of having this wider conversation about how these collections came to be, what some of the original justifications were, because I think when we, when we think about those things uh, more fully and more historically, it, it makes clear why some of the calls for the return of these remains, the repatriation, and in many cases, reburial of, of these remains is in fact warranted. And will likely, in my view, do very little actual damage to the scientific enterprise, which is something that is brought up quite frequently or cited quite frequently as a, a problem with 
uh, the potential repatriation and reburial of, of remains. I think the ethics surrounding these questions far outweighs the scientific gain in, in that way. And, and I wanted to explain that history in a book that was accessible for people who are interested and curious about museums, but maybe don't know as much as they'd like to about the history. I also respected uh, the measured and fair way that you treated the anthropologist. Uh, you didn't really portray them solely as villains, although I think you certainly could have painted that picture, at least in some of these instances, but you place them squarely in their own place and time. Uh, but personally, I'm, I'm intrigued about what your feelings are about these early anthropologists and archaeologists. Uh, do you think there's space to kind of measure these 21st century morals and scientific advances against these 19th century scientists? And how did this influence your research and writing process? Did you struggle with your own personal feelings or any bias when you're writing this? When writing the book, uh, I, I'm glad you sensed this. I think there are a lot of problems around the, even the concept of objectivity and the word objective, right? A lot of us will understand that listening to this podcast. But I tried to approach it from as neutral of a view as I, as I could and sort of write it straight, as it were, because the stories, I thought, were so revealing that even explaining them plainly and trying to pl uh, frame them plainly, I thought readers could quite easily reach their own conclusions. But yeah, I, I would go home after spending the day reading letters to and from, especially Alice Erdlichka, who is the Czech American first curator of physical anthropology at the Smithsonian Institution. Erdlichka really becomes a central character in the book. And man, he has a really unique personality. He can be prickly. He can be sharp tongued and rub people the wrong way. He's also clearly very clever and quick-witted, and he is remarkably effective at coordinating the collection of human remains from around the world. So we'll credit him with, with that ability to, to amass a massive number of human remains in an era where it was not easy to do so. However, he personally came off to me as a guy you wouldn't want to spend time with, for example, he once dressed down two young interns who arrived in the mid to late 1930s, I believe, to their new job working at the Smithsonian while wearing makeup. Um, and this was an era where it was already quite common, I understand, for, for women to wear makeup like that. He, he was very old fashioned and he thought wearing makeup was not appropriate for scientists. And he uh, apparently humiliated them in front of everyone in the lobby at the Smithsonian Institution on you know their first or second day of work. And that's just sort of the guy he was as a human. Um, I, I, I don't get the sense that you'd want to hang out and have a cup of coffee with him. But it, it, would have, it certainly would have been a really interesting conversation, but I don't get the sense that he would have been a nice, nice guy. But yeah, uh, I, I, I try as, as best I can to internally acknowledge and credit how I think and feel about these past people as I respond to them or as I encounter them in the archives and read dozens and sometimes hundreds or maybe thousands of their letters. You get a real sense of who a person is. But on the other hand, you, you don't get, a, you're, you're absent a certain sense of who they are. You never actually meet them. You don't know a, a great deal about them. And all you can really do is try to contextualize and understand them in their moment and their their social influences and who they were as a as a person. So I try to frame early anthropologists and archaeologists in that way, but still understanding the drive and motivation behind collecting massive amounts of human remains. My last question is that many museums seem to have no qualms or issues with displaying mummies from other countries. Um, as they are not actively collecting them, um, as far as I can tell, they just seem to happen to have them. Specifically, I saw an exhibition last year at the American Museum of Natural History on Peruvian and Egyptian mummies. So why, why do you think these exhibitions aren't as contentious as putting North American indigenous remains on display, especially when they're often acquired, as you noted, in similar ways? The displays of Egyptian mummies and mummies from Peru are sometimes viewed as less contentious, even though they were often acquired in similar ways, as you note in your question. 
This is a really fascinating subject to me. I've seen Egyptian mummies on display in Sweden and at a historical museum in Nashville, Tennessee, and, and in many other places. Once I read a letter, even as an undergraduate, I was writing about the history of collecting antiquities, and a museum director at a small science museum in St. Paul, Minnesota, said in response to a query about what Egyptian material the museum might have, well, of course we have an Egyptian mummy, but what self-respecting museum is without one? And that quote suggested to me the, the ubiquity of uh, the practice in both the United States and uh, in Europe, Great Britain especially, of collecting uh, Egyptian artifacts and objects and uh, uh, mummies written about by Brian Fagan and, and, and many others in terms of the massive waves of collecting of colonial France and uh, England and, and then later places like the United States that collect a massive amount of antiquities and bring them back to, to the United States. So partly it's just uh, the, the degree of physical separation. In the 1960s and 1970s, uh, and even earlier in some cases, when Native people become aware of how many objects of theirs are on display in museums that are sometimes geographically separated by hundreds of miles, there is a growing consciousness about that and a response to it, where Native people write letters, they start to organize and engage in active protests, things like performance art, but also lawsuits, uh, demanding that uh, certain objects, artifacts, and human remains be taken off display. So through this process, especially starting aggressively in the 1970s and stretching up through the 1990s, in 1990 you have the passage of the Native American Graves Protection uh, and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. And following NAGPRA, I think there's a real paradigm shift. It takes some time for, for things to really kick in, and there's a generational shift that takes place after the 1990s, I think especially. But there's a, a, a shift towards attitudes of displays of Native American remains especially, but then also questioning things like where African American remains came from in medical school collections and the degree to which that was connected to the story of chattel slavery in this country. So it's, it's complex, but uh, the answer, I think, has something to do with the historical forces at play. Now, in our ever increasingly connect, interconnected world, following especially the advent and widespread access to the internet, people are becoming more and more aware of these displays internationally, and a growing conversation is taking place about antiquities and the proper treatment of human remains. There have been some calls for these exhibitions to cease, but the calls have been less vigorous and intense from these particular nations being being mentioned. And the fact of the matter is that we in both the United States and Europe have become so used to these types of displays of Egyptian and Peruvian mummies. You know, I note some in the book Bone Rooms going back to the turn of the century. So it's, it's really become ingrained in the U.S. museum practice. So between that and uh, the geographic separation and the absence of the sort of similar political processes that pick up with the American Indian movement in the late 1960s, early 1970s, you end up having a different story with Egyptian remains, Peruvian remains, and remains originating from North America. Our next questions come from Beth Lander, college librarian at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. My name is Beth Lander, and I'm the librarian for the Historical Medical Library at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. The college is also home to the Mütter Museum. Sam Redman, in preparing for his book, Bone Rooms, did a lot of research using both of our collections. And I'm here today to ask Sam a couple of questions about his topic and, since I'm a librarian, a couple of questions about the sources that he used. I'd like to ask Sam about something that has been looked at and examined a lot lately by other researchers at the Historical Medical Library. 
and that is the justification for racial classification uh, and how they changed radically in the 19th century, uh, particularly between the biblically-based works of Josiah Knott and Samuel Norton, and then those texts written after Darwin published on the origin of species. So Sam, uh, do you think that secularization changed physicians or anthropologists' perspectives regarding the specimens they collected or purchased? I've spent some time thinking about it, and I don't think I have quite a satisfactory answer. I might actually argue that, well, this secularization certainly does take place in the biological sciences and amongst physicians, as you know. I don't know that it really changes the thrust of collecting human remains as much as you might think. Human remains already by this point had sort of become conceptualized as this commodity to tell stories and construct different types of narratives. As these fields become more professionalized, only becomes more aggressive and marks these fields, you know, certainly in different ways as they move along. But the thrust to continue gathering ultimately has much of the same effect. However, it does become a larger practice and increasingly widespread. At the Historical Medical Library at the College of Physicians, uh, we were told in 2015 that we hold the largest collection of anthropodermic books in the United States, uh, three of which were bound by a physician in 1887 using skin he removed from a woman who died at the Philadelphia General Hospital in 1869, which certainly begs the question of where the skin was between 1869 and 1887. Now, I've been asked many times why this physician would do this, and what would have made him think that this was even an acceptable thing to do. One theory I've read, which was developed by Carolyn Marvin at the University of Pennsylvania, ties this action to the developing professionalization of medicine after the Civil War and the concurrent rise of social status of physicians as a whole. Now, you reference, Sam, um, the privileged scientific elite, and that's your quote in your book. So how do you see physician participation in the development of bone rooms also conferring social and or professional superiority during the latter half of the 19th century? I wonder how many people listening to this podcast will be absolutely floored to learn that there are, in fact, books in libraries that are bound by human skin and that this was a fairly common practice uh, amongst physicians in the 19th century and perhaps earlier. This is something I knew very little about. And when starting uh, writing Bone Rooms, one of the, the problems that I sort of encountered and, and was thinking about is that a lot of what we're talking about are uh, collections of human bones or mummies, sometimes naturally mummified bodies, sometimes bodies that through a specific process of embalming and uh, ceremonies that work to mummify uh, the body in, in particular ways, as in ancient Egypt. But what about things like baby teeth that were collected as a memento of one's childhood and then left in a museum collection? or uh, snippets of lockets of people's hair that were often exchanged in letters, for example, in the 19th century. Fingernail clippings. I mean, there are almost an endless number of examples. Then there's another uh, category of, of objects that sits on the periphery here of human remains in an interesting way of prosthetic limbs. So prosthetic limbs, baby teeth, lockets of hair, to what extent are these human remains? In a certain clear way, they obviously are, and in other ways, they are treated quite differently in museum contexts than human bones or fully mummified bodies. So the way in which I think they connect to a privileged scientific elite, we can unpack that expression uh, even further, I suspect, but I think when one is in the position with both the knowledge and expertise and ability, as well as the will and uh, material ability to take human skin, to harvest it, and to create a decorative object 
of a, a, a bound book uh, with with the human skin on it, I think that's a strange reflection of some privileged status. As you mentioned, the other element here is that either through the act of collecting and holding on to material, there is an example of a army physician in the American West who collected as ordered uh, Native American skeletons, but left one Native woman's skull on his mantle for many years on account of the fact that she had beautiful teeth. So I, I think in a very real way, and sometimes to us surprising way, the act of these uh, establishing these collections established some uh, scientific credibility and some sense of status for people, sometimes in a precarious status situation like the American West, uh, or uh, being an immigrant to a new country. Uh, there are other ways in which people, I think, were encouraged or, or the sort of social pressure uh, was applied to create these collections. And, and it, it becomes this strange hobby to, to engage in and leaves us with this really, I think, complex legacy. What does one do with these books? So I'll be curious to learn more. Sam, you mentioned in the prologue that the large-scale exhibition of bodies was a uniquely American thing. Yet there were certainly scientists and anthropologists in Europe, Joseph Hurdle being one, who were examining remains within racial constructs. So why do you think there was not this display of bodies in Europe, particularly at a period of time when European colonization was racially justified? I mean, think for a moment about the views of Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton, about the lesser worth, and I put worth in quotes, of people who lived on the continent of Africa. And do you think Galton's uh, views were at all influenced by what was happening in America? I want to clarify that I do believe that a huge number of remains were in fact collected for European museums, and they were sometimes even exhibited over in museums in Europe. But what I think makes the U.S. example different is the massively widespread and diverse nature of the project and the way in which it cuts across our racial constructs and especially the, the, the commonly held sort of racial triad of Native Americans, African Americans, and European Americans who are engaging in this long process of uh, establishing and building up the United States in this incredibly racially contentious and often violent environment. And, and so how do they then reflect this in a museum context, I think is a, a really then profound and almost visceral example of this process playing out and the fact that it plays out in a context where the Native Americans can often see this happening in front of them firsthand, it becomes a unique dynamic. One that is perhaps reflected in places like Australia and elsewhere, but uh, as a student interested in this topic and then author, I became especially interested in the U.S. example. But I think these uh, stories do become especially intense in locations like the U.S. and Australia, where you have these intense racial intermixtures layered on top of this emergent science that is, in many respects, keen to underscore what they see as white racial superiority. So I think in order to see the problems in that, we need to understand the, the, the history of it and uh, see how its legacy created further problems in the U.S. where Native Americans were not granted citizenship for years and uh, African Americans were continually denied the right to vote based on racial prejudice. So in order to understand why and how we get that extreme degree of racial prejudice, uh, one answer lies in the process of rendering these people, these others, as being somehow less than through a scientific or pseudoscientific process. As librarian for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, I can't help but share Sam's frustration with the lack of primary sources that document or don't the history of the college. <laughs> 
The primary sources you reference in your book when discussing the Mütter Museum are few. Uh, you, you reference uh, museum catalogs, uh, you cite accession files, and you cite the records of the committee on, uh, on the Mütter Museum. So if you wouldn't mind, describe the process that you use to mine limited primary sources, as well as secondary sources, such as Gretchen Warden's book, in order to flesh out, pun intended, the bone rooms of the Mütter Museum. I love talking and thinking about sources and perhaps why I was so keen to draw out the story of the early story of the Mütter Museum is because I like a challenge. What can I say? But uh, you do point out a, a really interesting and difficult phenomenon in, in telling rich stories about the history of museums is that there are some areas or pockets in museum history where there is a ton of rich documentation. Everything you could ever want for and, and hope to or imagine to be documented seems to be documented. Correspondence, diaries, photographs, detailed reports, you know, expense accounts, you, you name it. You can have tons of different sources in some areas. And then in other areas, like for instance, what early visitors to the museum thought about their experiences, there's just very little uh, available in, ter in terms of that early documentation. So yeah, I would say uh, my strategy in a way is, is actually pretty unsophisticated in that I seek out as many different sources as I can possibly find and I read all of those sources both with a grain of salt and I try to read them against the grain and, and see what I can learn from them uh, sort of by looking at it up, down, and sideways. And then over time, I think a, a richer history begins to emerge. I want to mention one type of source that you shout out. I'm glad that you noticed. Accession files. So those are records that are associated with particular museum object when they come into the museum. Sometimes it includes the legal paperwork about their acquisition, but also they often include these amazing nuggets of detailed information about how objects were acquired, how they were originally displayed, and whether or not they were put on loan. And oftentimes these are in museum records set aside from their fuller archives. So uh, sometimes these types of files tend to be missed by historians that are going through these types of materials. So the short of it is that I tried to find as many sources as I possibly could. And in instances where there was less material, I, I think you, you try to be really measured in, in, in saying as much as you can, uh, but trying to draw out that portrait by using a little bit of educated conjecture based on what you know about the era and what you know from, from other sources. Let me give uh, one more example there. Is there are some really rich journalistic illustrations of the bodies of conjoined twins, famously conjoined twins, Chang and Ang, who garnered the nickname the Siamese Twins and tour the, uh, the country as almost these like vaudevillian showpieces. And when they die, an autopsy is, uh, it takes place at the College of Physicians. It's detailed in the media to a remarkable degree. But even though we have all of these sources, you need to take them with, with a grain of salt because the media is, of course, inflating these accounts and rendering them as salacious as possible in order to sell newspapers. So in, in a strange way, having many sources is not always better, but you, you like to compare and contrast and, and try to pull together a rich portrait, but from what sources are available. And I do think that there are some sources like accession files that are underutilized by museum historians. One question that I ask of all researchers who visit the Historical Medical Library, what was your favorite source that you used when you were writing your dissertation? And did you have a different favorite source when you were finishing up your book? And why were those sources your favorites? Now, I have to ask this in this day, day and age of digitization. Um, you get bonus points for describing the physical nature of your favorite source and how that physicality aided in your understanding of the topic being examined. And if you say hurdle skulls, I think you'll be cheating. <laughs> 
let me mention three that really stood out as remarkable. So I'll cheat a little because I want to mention something at your library. And let me begin by, you asked about favorite, and I can't help but remember this amazing architectural rendering, a a plan for a new exhibit at the Field Museum that uh, the exhibit ultimately opens in 1933. So this architectural rendering must have been sometime between 1930 and 1933, I suspect. And it had detailed uh, descriptions of what would go where in this planned galleries, including parts that I knew were eventually eliminated, proposed displays on hair and blood. Uh, But what made the architectural rendering so amazing to me was not just its level of detail, but its size. It was about six foot by six foot. And I really valued and appreciated when archivists would, with such great care, take out material, sometimes it was 100 years old, uh, that was not always easy to access. But man, what difference those sources often made for me in my thinking about how these exhibitions were laid out and what the experience must have been like walking through them. So I'm eternally grateful that uh, archivists at the Field Museum, at at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and elsewhere would take out these uh, materials and, and, and show them to me, a curious graduate student. When working at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, let me just mention sort of a, a bonus source in a way I have come across this absolutely remarkable scrapbook of material that was gathered about the 1918 influenza outbreak, the quote-unquote Spanish flu that uh, swept across the nation and the world and and killed uh, millions of people, many of them young and healthy. So uh, that was just such a remarkable source to stumble across in the medical library. And, you know, let me posit that as a sort of workplace hazard in my occupation is that if you're at all curious, you'll come across these sources that might not fit into the work that you're doing now. I certainly didn't use that material on the 1918 flu for my book Bone Rooms, but uh, I, I have used it later on in, in teaching and in thinking about uh, medical history and, and that era in U.S. history more generally. Uh, so what a fantastic resource and what a, an amazing library altogether. Your last question, though, was about what are some other sources that I've come to utilize when turning the dissertation into a book. And you also suggested uh, something about digitized resources and asked, degree to which that may uh, have connected here, and indeed it does, is that after leaving the University of California, Berkeley as a graduate student and starting my new position at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, I continued working on revising the project into the book Bone Rooms. And one of the things that uh, I discovered was a collection of newspaper sources that, you know, things become digitized more and more often. And one, again, crude research technique is to return to online databases and continue to try to punch in a variety of search terms that relate to the subjects that you're interested in. And so trolling across these online newspaper databases, I found a small cache of articles published in newspapers like the New York Times, which was not yet a a big national newspaper, but was Nevertheless, a a regular uh, regional local newspaper that was covering issues both in New York City and from a U.S. perspective, Uh, these really racially tinged, racist, uh, worded articles about collecting human remains from uh, the Philippines, of Filipinos in the wake of the Spanish-American War and during U.S. occupation there. These really stood out to me by virtue of the nature of the language, the really aggressive, offensive terms used to describe the Filipinos, but then also its connection then to the practice of collecting human remains uh, and then embedding them into this seemingly scientific process of uh, determining uh, different 
the different races of mankind, this project that obsessed so many scientists and collectors from around the country and the world. This has been a production of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. If you enjoyed this discussion of Bone Rooms and would like to hear future episodes, please subscribe to the series using your preferred podcast platform. For more information on the Consortium, please follow us on Facebook, on Twitter at chstmorg, or visit us at chstm.org. Thanks for listening. <laughs>